The Whole Foodie Festival is on at Whole Foods Market through October 3rd. Save on hundreds of culinary favorites like delectable cheeses, crackers, charcuterie, olives, and chocolates for that perfectly elevated snack board. Class up the party even more with short ribs, caviar, and produce on sale. And save on a huge selection of wine, including those made with organically grown grapes, starting at $6.99. Check out the Whole Foodie Festival today. Terms apply. Must be 21 plus. Please drink responsibly. Welcome to The Waves, Slate's podcast about gender, vaginas, and why old white men maybe shouldn't be the ones to name them. Every episode this month, you get me, Kat Chow, talking with someone smart about something I cannot get out of my brain. So the other day, and this is something I hear somewhat frequently, hello 30s, a friend went to the gynecologist and was having an exam, and the doctor told her, if you want kids one day, you should get pregnant soon. Otherwise, you're going to have a geriatric pregnancy. My friend is 35. All right, so we've all said that 40 is the new 30 and 50 is the new 40. So then why, if you get pregnant the day after your 35th birthday, are you suddenly old? It's true. Any pregnancy over the age of 35 is considered a pregnancy of advanced maternal age or even worse, a geriatric pregnancy. Geriatric pregnancy is a term that I think about a lot. We know so little about the female reproductive system, and I'm interested in who is making the decisions about our bodies, the scientists, the researchers, the doctors, who decide what to call our experiences and how to study them, how their own biases affect our lives. Geriatric pregnancy, just a little bit of a history lesson, it comes from a procedure in the 1970s that screened for genetic abnormalities. So in the 1970s was when we were first developing technology to look at a growing fetus, and that involved a small amount of risk to the fetus. That's Rachel E. Gross. You'll be hearing from her today, later in the show. They basically had a rough calculation at the time saying that when you were 35, the risk to the fetus of this intervention and the probability there would be an abnormality was about equal. So after 35, it was worth it to them doing the test. And so they made 35 this cutoff after which you were a geriatric pregnancy. Oh, you might remember Rachel from the episode of The Waves from last year, just a plug. That episode covered a lot, including why some people put suppositories of boric acid, which is rat poison, in their vaginas. Anyway, Rachel now has a column in the New York Times called Body Language. We'll talk about that column. We'll dig into something she told me over the phone recently, how bias gets written into the names of our bodies. We'll also get into something I've been wanting to chat with Rachel about for a long time. Bias as it relates to gender and race and reproductive health. That's all after the break. Hey Waves listeners, if you're loving the show and want to hear more, subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Thursday morning. While you're there, give our other episodes a listen too, like last week's about the bad mom trope and how that's been weaponized in a certain celebrity divorce. This episode of The Waves is brought to you by Planned Parenthood. Today, one in three women are blocked from getting abortion care in their home state. Over the past year, lawmakers in 22 states and counting have stripped reproductive freedom from nearly 21 million women, plus more trans and non-binary people. Across the country, politicians are pushing to control bodies, lives, and futures. They want a nationwide ban on abortion, and they're also attacking birth control, sex education, care for trans people, and more of our human rights. And there's just no end in sight. So Planned Parenthood is fighting to make sure that everyone can get the care they need. They'll never back down and they'll never stop fighting because everyone deserves sexual and reproductive health care, no matter what. You can join the movement and donate today. Visit PlannedParenthood.org slash future. This episode is brought to you by Pete's. 
Few things start your day better than a good coffee. That's why Pete's hand roast their coffee from a specific selection of high quality beans. And they don't just put those beans into anyone's hands. Pete's trains their roasters for 10,000 hours so they can master the roast that gives you the most. Pete's Coffee. Coffee for coffee people. Find Pete's online or at your local retailer. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Kat Chow, and I'm joined now by Rachel E. Gross, a science writer and a columnist at The New York Times. Hey, Rachel. Hey, Kat. Great to see you again. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So one of the things that I've been so excited to talk to you about is your new column in The New York Times called Body Language. Um, How did you get so interested in the story behind medical terms? I mean, this seems very specific. So how did this become your thing? Yeah, I think it was while writing my book, Vagina Obscura, that I, I was just endlessly going down rabbit holes about why all of these, quote, like women's body parts were named after men. So the fallopian tubes, the G spot, etc. And how kind of colonial, the naming of the female body felt to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I came across so much other contested language and the way that terms have evolved over time. And, you know, sometimes they reflect shifting culture, like our attitudes towards like believing that transgender healthcare should be covered and should be a process that medicine has some involvement in. And sometimes the language kind of led the cultural shift. Um, And I just found that it was so fascinating to dig into how we got the terms we use today that many of us don't even consider. Ooh, one that I realized recently was erectile dysfunctions. Ooh, tell me about erectile dysfunction. (laughs) Right. Everyone loves this. Um, So ED, which we see slapped across ads in the subway and is everywhere now, used to be called impotence. Um, And it was actually like a direct response to the fact that patients were, they they didn't feel great about it. It's something that's difficult to bring up that's emotionally sensitive with your doctor. And doctors realized that they weren't going to get men to bring these concerns to them to consider it a medical issue to realize that there were treatments, unless they made the language sound something more neutral, something less judgmental, and less kind of antiquated, like impotence is just like a lack of power, which is totally full of value. So that was like a I guess, a patient and doctor led change that now, you know, we're all familiar with. um, And no one would really say impotence. Impotence would just be so loaded. I mean, can you imagine how if that were still around as a term? Okay, so right, it is so loaded, right? There would be protests in the streets, Rachel. (laughs) There would be large protests. And yet, in pregnancy world, we have incompetent cervix and geriatric pregnancy is still used. And where are the protests in the streets, Kat? Yes. Where are the protests in the streets? I do not want to be told that I am going to have a geriatric pregnancy, which I probably will have if I have kids. And okay, so where do these terms come from? Can we start with geriatric pregnancy? <laughs> oh, yes. I know. There's there's so many. I get a little bit uh, all over the place. So geriatric pregnancy was a term that they came up with in the 70s. Um, it was sort of a translation of the Latin, which was like elderly prima gravida, which just meant like you're having kids, you're gravid, which used to mean pregnant. It's like weighty, um, which is already kind of interesting. And you're, well, elderly. So the way that they justified calling it geriatric was at the time they had just come up with a technology to do essentially like an amniocentesis. They came up with this like rough calculation that at about 35, um, the risk of that screening to the fetus, because there's a small, small risk, would be about equal to the probability that a child would have an abnormality. And so they said anything after that, we will call geriatric. So they chose 35 as this cutoff after which an amniocentesis would be worthwhile to medicine because it would pick up an abnormality and it would not require, it would not mean a higher risk to the fetus. Um, But I mean, it never should have been called geriatric in the beginning. 35 feels very arbitrary. It's super arbitrary. And like that calculation is not, it's not relevant anymore. We don't use that technology anymore. Like we've advanced so much. So it's just like a hangover. But now people talk about the 35 cliff and 
that your there's a idea that the risks to fetus and mother go up dramatically after that point, which is not the case at all. So it's misleading in that way. It is very misleading. And I think the cliff too makes it seem so dire because one of the things that, you know, a lot of peers or people who are approximately my age have talked about is I need to get pregnant now or soon or it's already too late. This is something that really surfaces because of something very arbitrary. And I think that is one of the things that you really illustrate well in um, body language is just where these kind of ridiculous notions come from. And one of the things that I really appreciate is how you've put it before is how bias gets written into the names of our bodies. And I think Mm. that's such a salient point. Can you talk more about that, that idea? Yeah, there's something that's really important to notice and unpack, which is that once something gets codified into medical language, it's treated as factual truth, as like neutral and accurate. Because as a society, we put so much stock into medicine as this just force of great authority. When you go to the doctor, you're in a vulnerable position, and this is supposed to be the expert on your body. And what they're telling you has weight. And that's why I think it's important to interrogate the language that doctors use, which, like as you said, is often quite arbitrary or stems from deep, deep bias. So there's some language that is literally the names of often white male doctors um, who have sort of planted these names like flags in our body. Um, And Mm. that's one thing that says something about the history of medicine, who was allowed to name our bodies, who had the power over defining the female body and what it was for. Um, And then there are those descriptive terms or names for diseases that have coded bias and make the patient feel a certain way and make people view diseases a certain way. So I mean, going back to pregnancy, the incompetent cervix, which I was like shocked to find is still in the literature. Incompetent. (laughs) I mean, now I find that one so funny because I just love to think of your cervix going in for its annual review and being really nervous. (laughs) It's Um, like the quarterly review where it's little boss cervix is saying, you're not very competent in this area. In fact, you're incompetent. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to need to put you on a probationary period to see if you can stay with this company. (laughs) Right. And and they, you know, there are these weird words of kind of corporateness that get laced in like um, failure. Failure to progress is a term applied to moms who are pushing out a baby who, like, again, are pushing for longer than the arbitrary threshold. And these words, again, have meaning. They have judgment. It feels like someone has deemed you a failure or that your body is incompetent and that someone happens to be medicine, which gives it extra weight. So the column that I started the series with actually was something I've always been interested in. It's Nazi eponyms for diseases. Um, Yes, this is what I was going to ask you about. Yeah, I'll just unpack that because that's there was one Nazi in particular. Yes. (laughs) Oh, right. Yes. So um, that was actually a shock to me. So the, the, the term Asperger's, which is was considered part of the autism spectrum um, and typically meant, quote, high functioning, which is also not really used anymore. It turned out um, a historian whose son was diagnosed with Asperger's and who was herself researching Hans Asperger, the pediatrician for whom it's named, found out that he was quite implicated in the Nazi machinery um, for kind of categorizing children into having the proper intellectual abilities into having lives worth living or not worth living. Um, And he was known as this hero who saved children by labeling them as high functioning and stuff like that, or having what we would now call Asperger's. But she found that it was a lot more complicated and that, you know, he, he cast himself as a savior after the war, but in reality, he was pretty complicit with this Nazi machinery. So I looked at kind of this, movement within medicine in the starting in the 90s around where people were waking up and realizing, oh, actually, a lot of these diseases are named for people who we really don't want to associate the values of medicine with. And we should probably 
switch these out and maybe we just shouldn't be naming diseases after people to begin with and that this was always a problem. So there was a comparison to kind of Confederate monuments. Yes, the taking down of the monuments. I think, you know, this kind of makes me think a lot about also the other consequences to having something with a name that people might not want to be associated with, whether it is, for example, a Nazi or a white supremacist, or whether it is something that is also seen as a source of shame. I'm thinking about the term vaginal atrophy, where that term can have consequences for who will seek a diagnosis. Can you talk about that too, the sort of branding of a uh, affliction and how it might lead to someone, I don't know, experiencing shame or deciding not to get care? Yeah, that's right. It is actually sort of parallel to the erectile dysfunction conversation um, where there is a phrase in medicine that many, many people in the community affected, in this case, people going through menopause, are saying, hey, this term makes me feel shame. I don't want to talk about it with my doctor. Um, I don't like it. It's insulting. Um, Like, don't tell me my vagina is atrophying. Yeah, the word atrophy just connotes, mm, I don't know. I mean, what is it? A disintegration? Right. I mean, it's, I think, literally like shrinkage and thinning of tissues. But, you know, it it does have these cultural um, meanings attached. Like, we all kind of are grimacing and wincing right here. And that means something, even if that's not what doctors intended, even if to them it's a neutral word, which to many of them it is. Um, And What was actually almost more fascinating to me is, you know, I dug into the term and why medicine is trying to change it now um, to a unfortunate kind of mouthful of a term, but um, it's like GSM, genitourinary symptoms of menopause. It's kind of a broader category. So, you know, could have done something more like ED, I think. But anyways, (laughs) um, (laughs) when I looked into why medicine was saying like, hey, yeah, we agree, this is not great. Um, They were saying, actually, this is not just insulting, but it's medically misleading, like potentially inaccurate, because vaginal atrophy as the symptom and as the thing that treatments like estrogen are prescribed for suggests that's the main symptom that people are coming in for. And actually, and, and it's supposed to be the symptoms from a loss of estrogen. And actually, a really big symptom from that is urinary. It's recurrent UTIs, which are a symptom of menopause because the urinary system is affected as much as the genital system, because it's full of receptors for estrogen. And without estrogen, it has the same problems. So by making vaginal atrophy the term that's used for prescriptions, that's used in medical notes, you're actually leaving out a huge proportion of people that could really benefit from this Mm. diagnosis, from this treatment. And so many people I knew did not know that that was a symptom of menopause that had treatments. So the doctors were arguing that this is a massive underdiagnosis that could easily be solved and language had a part in that solution. Wow, it's just way too reductive. It is not precise enough and it is detrimental to a lot of people experiencing menopause. That is actually, that makes a lot of sense if you just pause and think about it. This is actually a really good segue to language and how it shifts in relation to um, becoming more culturally relevant. After the Dobbs decision, we have seen a shift in the ways people talk about pregnancy language. Can you talk more about that? Oh my gosh, yes. And it was interesting because I stumbled across this when I was looking at pregnancy language. The, The language of abortion and the conversation around abortion is inextricably tied up with pregnancy language. So soon after Dobbs, a lot of medical associations and then places like the ACLU even um, kind of put out a statement saying, we're not going to say pregnant women anymore. We're going to say uh, pregnant people, um, sometimes people with uteruses. And it wasn't just what you might think saying like, yes, um, people of all genders, including trans men, can get pregnant. It was also saying that girls get pregnant, like people who are under 18. Oof. And it's important to say who is affected, you know, who can get pregnant and therefore who is affected by abortion laws. And, you know, even though people, pregnant people can sound more vague to some, it's actually more precise. Right. And now 
yeah, like medical journals also, they use pregnant women when that's the criteria that they're looking at. But if it's not, and there could be trans men, intersex people or girls, then they want to say pregnant people, or it's, it's not accurate. Another thing I noticed was there was a bigger move to separate um, miscarriage from abortion because the the phrase spontaneous abortion means miscarriage in doctor speak. Um, so you would you might get diagnosed with that. It might be on your medical notes. And for some people that had a, a very different weight. Um, you know, it's complicated because for some people they felt blamed as if they chose to do this. Right. Even though a, a abortion just means like the ending of a pregnancy. And I think doctors wanted to be sensitive to that and not imply that. Um, I guess kind of like incompetent cervix, it's saying like, hey, you did something wrong. There's a level of judgment again that's kind of inextricably tied to it. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I'm hesitating is just because the judgment isn't saying that an abortion is wrong. It's just saying this is a different thing to happen to you. And there's a different, um, like if, if you had a, a a miscarriage, you didn't choose that, no matter how how your choices might be limited under this the current legal system. Um, but either way, what used to be totally fine language because doctors understood it, now it's like, maybe we should be more sensitive about this. This is the tough part is that these language shifts can often feel like they're part of cancel culture, or they are some sort of, um, I don't know, have a liberal agenda. You know, in many cases, the argument is that it's more precise, it's more relevant to our current cultural times, because again, so much medical language comes from the 1800s. And guess what? Things have changed since then, and medicine needs to update as well. We're going to take a break right now, but if you want to hear more from Rachel and me on another topic, check out our Slate Plus segment. We're going to be talking about the documentary Everybody, which Rachel cannot stop thinking about. We live in a society that's so binary. So as an intersex person, where do I fit? And please consider supporting the show by joining Slate Plus. Members get benefits like zero ads on any Slate podcast, no hitting that paywall on the Slate site, and bonus content of shows like this one. To learn more, go to slate.com slash the waves plus. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else. Like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. The Whole Foodie Festival is on at Whole Foods Market through October 3rd. Save on hundreds of culinary favorites like delectable cheeses, crackers, charcuterie, olives, and chocolates for that perfectly elevated snack board. Class up the party even more with short ribs, caviar, and produce on sale. And save on a huge selection of wine, including those made with organically grown grapes, starting at $6.99. Check out the Whole Foodie Festival today. Terms apply. Must be 21+. plus. Please drink responsibly. Welcome back to The Waves. I'm Kat Chow, and I'm chatting with Rachel E. Gross, a journalist and author of Vagina Obscura. We're talking about some of the ways that bias factors into the language of how we talk about reproductive health. But now, Rachel, I want to broaden out a bit more and talk more generally about some of the bias in reproductive health that you've actually picked up on in your reporting, um, but also that I've just wanted to talk to you about for a long time. Um, And it's sort of the overlap of race as it relates to all of this. Can we talk about the American man who some consider to be the father of modern gynecology? <laughs> Oof. I mean, I think we kind of have to yes. uh, if we talk about reproductive health. Who is who is this man? <laughs> yeah. So until fairly recently, medicine considered James Marion Sims, who was a 
doctor who was a Southern slaveholder practicing in Alabama, they considered him to be the father of modern gynecology. Such a weird phrase in general, the father Ew. of modern gynecology, just right. paternalistic. And then also, I don't, I don't know if I need a man associated with my gynecology and the knowledge of it. Oh my God. All of those things. And historians have definitely pointed out like, hmm, there's no mothers in this field. <laughs> this is not the case anymore. He has been very much critiqued. Um, he did his early work basically on enslaved Black women who could not give meaningful consent. And that's where he developed the techniques that brought him global glory and made him renowned, again, in the world. They basically put American gynecology on the map. And it was not considered problematic at the time that he experimented on vulnerable populations. Um, and it was quite sinister. You wrote about this in Vagina Obscura, where other slaveholders would come to this man, James Marion Sims, and they would sort of present a problem, sort of with the idea of, oh, this woman who I have enslaved to perform labor on this land um, cannot do her job, and so mm -hmm. please help me. And... Um, you, you actually wrote about these three women in particular who were named Betsy, Anarka, and Lucy. You also pointed out this kind of gross racial paradox, this cognitive dissonance. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And I just want to mention like that chapter, I owed so much to a historian named Deirdre Cooper Owens, who wrote the book on this essentially. And she was the one who was pointing out that these early days of gynecology was, you cannot separate it from the institution of slavery. Because as you're saying, the whole reason that these experiments came about was because these women were, were considered not to be able to do their labor and reproductive labor. Um, and so they needed fixing. And so medicine needed to fix it, the problem. Um, and so the paradox that was being kind of practiced was that at the time, Black women were seen as like so different from genteel white women yes. that, you know, you couldn't compare the two. And there were these horrible racist stereotypes, which still linger in medicine about black women feeling less pain, being able to endure more. Um, so you hear Sim say that a lot. So like there was this like these disgusting assumptions being put upon them and saying how different they were from white women. But then Basically, the the strategies that were developed on them and these interventions were they just took and immediately applied to white women saying like, oh, yeah, like women's bodies are all the same. So we can just use this universally. And there's something really messed up about that, that when it is convenient, when you want to experiment on vulnerable populations, then they're like super different. It's OK. They're not like truly human. But right. when the, you want to use that data and and you want to gain the glory of being a world-renowned physician, well, then they're the same as all other women. Then they're just universal humans. Yeah. You're not, you know, as an enslaved person, you are not human enough to be free or spared from the pain from these terrible surgeries. Right. And yet you are human enough to be the basis of study that will actually benefit white women. Right. To be the foundation of gynecology. What this relates to is, oh, you know, when we're talking about understanding differences, um, mm -hmm. and I'm putting these in scare quotes, but, um, and I also want to be very careful on how we talk about this because yeah. um, I think there is a tendency, which you have pointed out before, and mm -hmm. you talk about often within science to cite these biological factors um, mm -hmm. for why say, for example, a certain group might be at higher risk or predisposed to XYZ affliction versus others, but it might not actually be biological factors. Can you talk more about that? It might be more about, say, socioeconomic factors or something of that nature. Yeah, I think in the past 10 years, medicine and science have really come to question the category of race to begin with, because race has always held some assumptions about biological difference. Which goes back to so many um, eugenics, um, <laughs> you know, just oh, yes, uh, that's right. you know, those, again, old white men, those uh, 
earlier explorers trying to measure brains and whatnot. Right. I mean, even like scientific greats like Darwin, who loved to talk about biological difference between men and women and white men and the rest of the world and talked about like primitives and terrible things like that. So yeah, I would say that attitude still lingers in medicine in ways that are just harder to sort out. Yeah, when sort of white women become this standard that everyone else is trying to be held up to. Hmm. Right. And that's, that's the other big dissonance in medicine is that, you know, until 1993, we didn't require women or minorities or minority women to be part of clinical trials. And so we were again making this huge, that was the NIH. Well, what? (laughs) Yeah. So again, there was this assumption that um, we're going to take out women from the trials because they're too variable. They have like a menstrual cycle going on. That's too confusing. We're going to stick with white men. They're more stable. But then we're going to extrapolate everything we find to women and people of color. This is so confusing. Yeah, it's the cognitive dissonance thing. So women were taken out of these studies because they had recurring periods. That was the common reason. Or they would put them all in the same birth control regimen so they wouldn't have their periods. They wouldn't have this variability. But again, then if you're saying that this variability is so important and you're not understanding it and you're not probing it, then whatever treatments, whatever understanding you come up with is not going to take into account half the people on earth. Oh my goodness. Rachel, I do know that you have spent quite a while reporting on a a new body of research, perhaps, related to menstrual blood. This seems related. Yeah, I'm doing a deep dive as we speak into menstrual blood. And basically, again, in just the past 10 years, medicine has realized that menstrual blood is this extremely like data-rich fluid that has all these markers that tell you about reproductive health, fertility, reproductive disease, possibly like overall health, like immunity, markers for diabetes, that sort of stuff. So they're just now saying, oh, this fluid we considered waste, we should maybe be using medically um, and taking advantage of to help women understand their health. Um, And yeah, I would say it's related because by avoiding the menstrual cycle altogether, uh, medicine kind of, there was no way that they would have realized this. They were thinking like how to avoid this complexity, how to not have to confront directly that we don't fully understand how the menstrual cycle works. Oh my gosh. It just seems so basic to me. Okay. I'm not obviously a scientist or a doctor, but we know so little about, you know, vaginas and uteruses and how reproductive systems work in this way. And to not study menstrual blood. I mean, here, please take all of mine. I don't want it. (laughs) Study it. Right. I don't want it. But like, I also would love to know that it's working for me and giving me important information. And the stuff they're working on now is would really move women's health forward a lot. Like we don't have a diagnosis, a way to easily diagnose things like endometriosis and problems that are really common, but potentially menstrual blood could do that without being invasive, without being a surgery. So this would benefit so many people and help us understand this universal process. And this actually makes me think about endometriosis more generally, which Mm -hmm. is an affliction that um, I have, so many people have, and mine was discovered because I had a myomectomy in 2023 to remove fibroids. When wow. the surgeons went in and took out my fibroids, they also discovered a bunch of endometriosis. And it was so fascinating just seeing these images because, of course, I feel like this is also something you would do, Rachel. I asked for images. <laughs> I yes. asked for them to take photos and document it. Um, and so I have photos of the endometriosis that they kind of shaved off or carved off of me. But you have written about the history of endometriosis sort of seen in, um, seen decades ago as a kind of career woman's disease, or Mm -hmm. um, even, I think, a term that some people have used as the like neurotic white woman disease. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that and how it became this stereotype? Yeah, that's that's so crazy, Kat, to hear. Um, 
like I know that I always hear that the most common way endometriosis is discovered is through other surgeries, specifically like infertility patients. So endometriosis, it has this unfortunate reality of that medicine could not see it. It was an, an invisible disease for so long because we didn't have those tools and that imaging. And so I think it was subject to a lot of assumptions. And one of them was basically the assumption this is a form of hysteria, that it's kind of a psychological uh, punishment that women are undergoing because they failed to have children. And so Hmm. that the language, the neurotic white women or career women who forego childbearing, that's from medical textbooks. I believe it's from an endocrinology textbook in the 1990s. So recent. <laughs> right. And and it's not like, like, it sounds like something that someone might be like yelling on the street, but this is coming from doctors. I think I have the quote here. Can I read it? Oh, please. So a study that basically described the stereotype of patients with endometriosis, described them as underweight, overanxious, intelligent, perfectionist, white, of high social and economic standing between 30 and 40 years with regular menstruation and ovulation, who regularly delay childbirth. Yes, that's right. That was kind of the summary of the typical patient as described by medicine. So yeah, it was just striking how much this drew on ideas of like, that's what hysteria was in Greek times and later was basically your uterus is acting up and choking you and wandering at your body because it wants sex and motherhood and you're not giving it to it. It's so too it's competent, the- maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's too independent. It's actually quite assertive yeah. for a woman and should maybe be more passive. <laughs> the review of your uterus is just, it's just too much. Overachiever, 110%. <laughs> oh my gosh. So yeah, right. So it was like an overactive reproductive system, a reproductive system gone haywire, your body kind of punishing you. And um, to some extent, that is how endometriosis was often described. So I I talked to a bioengineer in the book who was told by, in this case, her psychiatrist, that she was uh, rejecting her female role. And that's why her body was doing this. And you know, the implication being she should get pregnant. And there were medical papers written up that suggested pregnancy as a cure for endometriosis, which has been totally debunked and is extra cruel because endometriosis can cause problems with fertility. So again, we've talked about how endometriosis is this almost unseen disease, unless you have, you know, (laughs) surgery to go in and give you this definitive diagnosis. Um, And so often, People who do exhibit symptoms, you know, who are experiencing so much pain, have a hard time getting that diagnosis. How does this play out for um, people of color or people who are masculine presenting women or non-binary folks or trans men? Yeah. So the average time for diagnosis is like seven to 10 years. And, you know, that that number in itself probably reflects a bias towards like higher class and white women. But yeah, so as I was writing about that engineer and about that kind of that kind of stereotype of the neurotic white career woman, I realized that I needed to talk to people who did not fit that stereotype and see who was falling through the cracks. And um, I talked to several women of color who like, kind of experienced the same assumptions from Marin Sims times. So first of all, that they should be able to endure it because they should be able to handle this kind of pain. And second of all, that they were drug seekers when they came into like the emergency room screaming. And I remember just this really disturbing fact was that um, at least one of them, it was only when her husband accompanied her to the emergency room and made the request that they took her seriously. And she was Ooh. literally a reproductive health historian. Like, wow, wow. The irony there. Can you imagine? Yeah. And then um, definitely for queer male presenting or masculine presenting women um, and trans men, the problems are compounded because doctors are looking for a certain type of patient and they're not even thinking about endometriosis. This is already assuming they know enough about endometriosis, which many don't, but they're not even considering it when it comes to people that don't look like this stereotype patient. So I talked to a trans man who went through a horrifying ordeal trying to get eventually a hysterectomy because his symptoms were so bad. And, you know, it's, 
It's about not being able to access reproductive health care because it's labeled as women's health care, even for insurance purposes. But it's also about being at the mercy of the personal beliefs of doctors, um, in his case, some of whom didn't want to assist in his transition and didn't want to do a hysterectomy on a trans man, didn't want to consider it. Whereas for other women, historically, sterilization hysterectomies have been common and coerced. For many women of color, there were things like semi-permanent, I'm thinking of like Norplant and like implants where mm. You would be encouraged and sometimes your like welfare might be reliant on getting this form of birth control that only your doctor could remove. So it's it's basically like who do we allow access to medical treatments? Who do we want to reproduce and not reproduce? So who do we want to keep their uterus and encourage to get pregnant? Right? And who do we not? <laughs> yes, this is getting very dicey. Yeah. So yeah, I mean going back to the eugenics stuff, I think. I don't want to paint all of medicine as sinister because absolutely it's not. And I feel like maybe I am right now, but there are just hidden biases, some of whom are even hidden to doctors who mean well, um, that I think need to be teased out so we can make these connections to things like eugenics and realize what's happening here. And I think that ties really well to what we were discussing about language, too, and how that informs um, so much of how we see our bodies and how we interact and engage with the things that are, you know, that we are experiencing, because it yeah. says so much. And language is also a vessel for bias, just as these names are and these ways these experiments are designed. That's right. So even something as simple as considering endometriosis to be an infertility disease, a disease that is mainly important because it can affect pregnancy, that undervalues people's quality of life, their suffering, their pain. And like, I think oftentimes that's the big battle for what we consider like women's issues or women's health issues is saying, yeah, it's not cancer, it won't kill me, but it's making my life miserable and medicine needs to value the pain of people who have these organs. Rachel, thank you so much for this. This has been enlightening. Thank you so much, Kat. That's our show this week. I'm Kat Chow. I wrote and produced this episode. You can follow me on Instagram at katchow underscore. Say hi. The Waves is produced by Shana Roth and Vic Whitley-Berry. Daisy Rosario is Senior Supervising Producer. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio. And we want to hear from you. Send us fan mail. Email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different topic, same time and place, same host, me, Kat Chow. Thanks so much for being a Slate Plus member. And since you're a member, you get this weekly segment. Today, Rachel and I are talking about the documentary Every Body by the director Julie Cohen and the editor Kelly Kendrick. Just existing as an intersex person is grounds for celebration in a whole world that doesn't see us. But you know what? I am intersex. 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 We are here now. It follows the stories of three intersex people and also weaves in a lot of history and context. It's a documentary that Rachel has been raving about. Okay, Rachel, what do you find so compelling about everybody? I think this film is groundbreaking. I have been... uh, following the intersex rights movement and looking into it for maybe four years now, because it's like halfway through my book, I started realizing how important this community of people um, was to how medicine defines women and men. That was just some of our Slate Plus segment. If you want to hear the whole thing, go to slate.com slash the waves plus to become a Slate Plus member today. Slate.com slash the waves plus. Hey, everybody. It's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts. 
DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.